じゃあ,あのこれからあの3年目の方をつなげると思います、えー、彼は今家にいると思いますそう、so, It's your turn and、uh, we'd like to start your presentation right now、so, Could you please set the sharing for your、uh, screen and、uh, Make a full screen mode of the、uh, slide? Uh, should be full screen, is it not? Are you not seeing full screen?、Uh, okay, it's okay.、Uh, it's quite visible. So, please go ahead. Hello, Gazaimas. I do, still did not learn to,、uh, know Japanese.、Uh, but but、uh, there is、uh, some, somebody who should say that Ni Hao or Ni Tao. <laughs> Uh, my name is Tim Bird. I am the architecture group chair of the CE Work Group, the Milner Ridge Foundation. And uh, I uh, give a talk called The Status of Embedded Linux.、Uh, I'm going to give this talk、uh, today. This is a talk that I give、uh, fairly often at、uh, conferences and、uh, also at Jan Marie's. I apologize if、uh, some of this material is a repeat.、Uh, what I do is I kind of add in new material as Uh, things happen. This talk covers about one year's worth of、uh, information about the last、uh, year of development, mainly in the kernel space, but also just in the embedded space where Linux is being used. So, for this <coughs> talk, I will talk about the kernel versions that have、uh, been released in the last year,、uh, and I'll go over those. Fairly quickly,、uh, the main part of the talk is about the different technology areas that are in the kernel. Uh, I hope that this is useful for people who are、uh, looking at using、uh, newer kernels as you migrate from、uh, older kernels that may be in your existing products. You can see what types of features are available in some of the more recent kernels.、Um, then I'll talk about the CE Workgroup projects,、uh, including some other stuff. I was recently at the Kernel Summit,、uh, so this time I'll give a little bit of a mini report. Uh, just my impressions of some of the things that、uh, happened at the Kernel Summit. And、uh, then I'll just give some pointers to some resources. So, starting off with the Kernel version.、Uh, in the last year,、uh, you can see that we've had a very, very regular、uh, cadence or regular interval for the Kernel versions. It, it is now very common to see 63 days, so just over two months. And I don't know if you、uh, recognize there's a pattern. Uh, to these. The, it turns out that、uh, this, I just figured out this pattern. Linus always starts the merge window, always does the release and starts the new merge window on a Sunday. So this is going to help my predictions quite a bit now that I've、uh, noticed this pattern. That's why、uh, his patterns are always <coughs> multiple of seven days.、Uh, so he either takes nine weeks or ten weeks、uh, to release a kernel. That's been the pattern the last,、uh, well, for the last year. Um, and so we just, that, that actually is really useful、uh, so that we can kind of predict when the next stable kernel is going to be. And having the kernel only take nine weeks between versions means that developers can、uh, get something into the maintainers and they know that it will not be a very long time before they can actually start using it in a released kernel. So that's actually really good. So we're in the 4.4 merge window now. So the merge window usually is two to three weeks, the first two to three weeks of that、uh, development cycle. And so we don't actually know for sure everything that's in this because we're still collecting it.、Um, but、uh, we can kind of make the prediction that、uh, the beginning part of、uh, January of 2016 will be when we actually see 4.4. And that will become important. Become、uh, important to know、uh, based on some other information that I'll talk about in this talk. So, that's just some、uh, kind of some interesting things、uh, about the kernel version process. So, in Linux version 3.17,、uh, this, this version of the kernel saw a lot of new ARM hardware support,、uh, a lot of different SOCs, some all winner SOCs, some, some、uh, different. 
uh, evaluation boards, OMAP evaluation boards, and others. Um, and then there's also a lot of ARM boards that were already in the kernel that got a lot of improvements in 317. Uh, inside the kernel also in terms of test, uh, testing, uh, there's a new feature, uh, config bisect in ktest, uh, that's very useful for finding out if you have a, a version of the kernel uh, and uh, the in one configuration of the kernel something breaks and another configuration that doesn't break, you can actually use ktest to do the same thing we do with git bisect to find the commit that broke it. Config bisect allows you to find the configuration option uh, that uh, is probably responsible for the problem. Uh, so that's an interesting new test feature. Uh, in version 3.18 of the kernel, we saw overlay FS introduced. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Some size reduction patches, uh, more LLVM support, uh, and then continued SOC support. So high silicon, that's from uh, the Huawei's chip, uh, AM Logic, ArenaSOS, Arcar, some Broadcom, and Apple chips also got support in this kernel. Uh, in 3.19, uh, we saw some extensions to F2FS, uh, which is a file system specific for embedded. It now has a fast boot option, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, device tree overlay support. Uh, Squash FS now supports LG4 compression. So I, I think that's the fourth compression uh, algorithm that's supported by Squash FS. So you really can choose and tune your compression to meet your performance needs and, and your space requirements. Uh, in this version of the kernel, also the Android binder code has, has been moved from the staging tree into the regular uh, areas of the tree, meaning that binder is kind of now an accepted API in the kernel. Uh, binder is an inter-process communication system specific to Android. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to making Android uh, features Features that were just custom to specifically targeted Android, there was resistance to making those uh, full-fledged features. But I think the kernel community is over that now. Uh, so there's support for Android features, and there's Google developers that are active in the kernel community, and other developers helping them move Google, Google features into the mainline kernel as full-fledged uh, uh, APIs and ABIs. In Linux uh, version 4.0, uh, one of the biggest things was that it is not version 3.20. Linus decided that he was going to uh, change the major version number. Um, and he actually did this by conducting a survey. Uh, so uh, the name of the kernel is Herd or I'm a Sheep because uh, he uh, is just going along with the crowd. Um, but uh, he. Uh, said that there are no really massive big features. This is not like other software where you change the major version when uh, some big new feature or some uh, break with compatibility with the past occurs. It was just kind of a natural progression. He says he doesn't like to get up over about 20 uh, versions before he changes the top version. He doesn't want like a 3.99 or a, something like that. Um, Android Binder added uh, some additional security hooks. Um, and there's a lot of support now for using SE Linux uh, security with Android. Uh, and then we start to see some non-volatile memory support patches. Um, so the, some of the very first patches to go in to support non-volatile memory had to do with using a file system, between a file system and persistent memory. And there's an LWN.net article you can, you can look at if you want to look at that. Uh, in general, I use a lot of, uh, I have a lot of references to uh, LWN.net articles, so you'll see references to those, and, and also to ELC and ELC Europe Embedded Linux Conference talks uh, that people have given. So if you want to follow up and uh, there's any topic here that you find interesting, you can go uh, look at those uh, resources to, to get more information. Then also in Linux 4.0, we saw some UBIFS performance improvements. Uh, that's very welcome. In Linux 4.1, so this is, uh, let's see, when was this? Probably uh, just over the summer, probably June timeframe, May or June timeframe, we saw a new TraceFS file system. Uh, the kernel self-test uh, is uh, getting more mature, and it now has an install target that's specifically there to support 
uh, cross compilation and using uh, kernel self test for cross uh, cross systems development, like we use in embedded. Also, the ability to attach VPF programs to kernel probes. Uh, a very strange uh, system which allows an ITC subsystem uh, can function in slave mode. So a Linux device can be a slave on the ITC bus instead of being the host on the ITC bus. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then we you can configure the kernel for single user operation. I'll talk more about that when I get to the sanitation project. And then in Linux 4.2, uh, we saw Linux security module stacking. Uh, this is a feature uh, having to do with supporting multiple security uh, frameworks at a time in the kernel. Uh, this had been uh, attempted to be mainlined oh, many, many years ago, probably uh, eight or nine years ago. It didn't, didn't go very far, but this time it actually got in. Um, and then F2FS supports profile encryption. In this version of the kernel, there was uh, some support added for AMD GPUs. Um, and there's, uh, interestingly, in this version of the kernel, lots of pin control drivers. Uh, that's actually good. Um, some of the first stuff you see getting mainlined for any particular SOC are, are some of the low-level bits, like the clock drivers and uh, um, the regulators and the pin control drivers. So I think this is really good because it shows that there's kind of a foundation being laid for uh, more system-on-chip work going into the future. And then also in 4.2, uh, we saw lib NVDM or NVDIM. Uh, and this is a, a internal library in the kernel for dealing with non-volatile non -volatile memory. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic that's going to get uh, a lot more attention in the future. And then finally, Linux 4.3. 4.3 was just released uh, two weeks ago uh, in terms of kind of finishing its development cycle. It was now uh, published. Uh, we saw media-oriented systems transport, uh, which is a framework in the automotive market for multimedia networking. And then we also saw something interesting. We saw the removal of a file system, the ext3 file system. Uh, there used to be some standalone code that executed the ext3 file system, but that has actually been removed. Uh, so there are still systems that have uh, existing file systems that are ext formatted in ext3, uh, but the the code in the tree that handles ext4 has backwards compatibility, so it can support both ext4 and ext3. So that old ext3 code that was standalone by itself was no longer needed. Um, having said all that, just a couple of things that uh, I think are really interesting to watch in the next year. Uh, I've had this, the, the top bullet here I've had on, on my slides for a long time, um, and KD bus. So there's an effort to support uh, DBus, which is interprocessor communication mechanism, and to put that into the kernel. Um, and uh, there was some <coughs> resistance to the current implementation of KD bus, uh, and there was some pullback and some parts that got reworked. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there, was, um, there was another kind of pullback. People said they were going to remove the support for KD bus from some, uh, I believe, some Red Hat based systems. And so the developers of KD bus, they don't have it upstream yet, but they're, uh, they said they're kind of going to, they're going to go back to the drawing board, which means they're going to kind of take a step back, look at the issues that people are having, and uh, re architect parts of the system. And so that's uh, just been in the news recently. So this is taking much, much longer than people expected uh, to get into the kernel. Uh, so we'll have to see uh, how it does. Um, another another thing to watch is kernel signification. I'm very interested in using Linux on uh, very small systems or to see how Linux can be used on very small systems. And so this project uh, continues. Uh, People are submitting patches to try and make Linux smaller. Uh, not a lot of patches, though. So this project is kind of moving slowly. Um, I, I think it'd be nice if it moved a little bit faster. We have uh, the RT preamp patches. I'm going to talk about those a lot, uh, so I won't go into great detail here. But that's something that I think we'll see a lot more activity uh, in the future. Also, persistent memory. Uh, both uh, Intel 
and Hewlett Packard have announced uh, persistent memory systems uh, that are supposed to provide um, memory that is low power in terms of switching costs uh, or in terms of uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, power it takes to, to write to. Uh, this is compared to flash. Flash is a uh, relatively fast memory, but it requires quite a bit of power to switch. Um, both the Intel and the Hewlett Packard memory is, uh, is uh, less expensive than flash, uh, has more, supports more write cycles, and, uh, and uh, re requires much less power. So it'll be really interesting to see where this fits in the, in the grand scheme of things. I think we're gonna see quite a bit. In the next year, uh, we'll see a lot of uh, persistent memory systems rolling out and see how Linux deals with that will be interesting. And then finally, SOC mainlining. Uh, there's a lot of SOCs that are upstream or that have basic support. Well, we'll continue to see a lot of features going up. There's a lot of code that still needs to go up, especially in the mobile space, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, just in terms of overall, just an observation, the kernel uh, process uh, is getting better, and I was going to, uh, John Corbett gave a good talk at the Korea Linux uh, forum just a couple of weeks ago, talking about uh, how many how many patches get into each merge window, and uh, we're now on the order of I think thirteen or fourteen thousand patches uh, get introduced into the kernel every nine weeks, um, and the merge process is actually getting better. So um, the way the merge the way the merge works is uh, Linus adds a bunch of patches that have been put into uh, the Linux next tree, which is kind of the staging area, and then that's called the merge window, and all the patches come in. Uh, and the, uh, at the beginning of the development cycle. And then that merge window closes and Linus introduces the release candidate series, so RC1 through RC usually six, seven, or eight. Um, and so one way to look at the kernel processes is to see, well, how many fixes have to come in after he's done that initial merge? If you look at the 3.0 release, 19% or almost 20%, one fifth of the commit uh, came in and were kind of fixes that came in after the merge window closed. Well, in the 4.1 release, that's down to close to 10%. So we're actually doing a lot better at pre-integration of the patches. And so even though we're still doing 13 or 14,000 patches, a uh, bulk of those, 90% of those, come in and uh, any conflicts or problems get resolved in the first, uh, the, that first two to three weeks of the development cycle. And then about 10% come in as everything uh, stabilizes. So that's actually really, uh, really good. For a project this size, that's really uh, amazing. And uh, we'll continue to see, uh, I think, process improvements, uh, particularly with some of the testing that I'll talk about later. Uh, that's going on now in the kernel. So let me talk uh, now about specific technology areas. That was kind of a real quick uh, overview of just uh, specific kernel versions. Uh, but now I'd like to kind of go uh, through different areas of technology in the kernel and what's been going on and, and some resources for those. So boot up time, uh, a lot of people in Embedded are interested in boot up time. I think some of the big news here is uh, x86, uh, Intel released some patches for to do execute in place, uh, which allows you to uh, execute code without having to uh, move it from flash into RAM, which I, uh, saves a, a copy cost, the cost of copying that uh, uh, either the kernel or the application. Uh, so that's actually pretty interesting. Um, another uh, thing that uh, people have been using for boot up time is deferred init calls. There were some patches that are still out of tree on this. That's actually related a little bit to another issue that came up at the kernel summit called asynchronous probing. Now, asynchronous probing has been in the kernel for uh, a couple of years now. It was originally introduced by uh, Arjun Van uh, and it allows for while, while what, basically multi-threading the probe routines in the kernel. As the drivers load, each driver that loads uh, a routine is called, called the probe routine that does the initialization and, and uh, looks, looks on the different buses, finds out what needs to uh, be going on, and 
a couple of years ago, they made it possible for uh, drivers to do that in an asynchronous fashion, so that multiple of those could run at the same time. So it wasn't just single threaded all the way through the entire boot process. Well, there's still there's still drivers that do not take advantage of that. Yeah, that's something you have to turn on and support for in your driver. And so there's quite a few drivers uh, that are not using those that asynchronous uh, probing yet. And so uh, that was a big discussion at the kernel summit: is uh, uh, should we make some changes? Why why aren't drivers using the existing support that's there? Um, another thing. Uh, that came up at the kernel summit was a uh, reduction in probe deferral. Uh, so there are some systems, this is very common in embedded systems, where you want, uh, you don't need to get the entire system up quickly. Uh, well, that'd be nice, but it's suitable or it's, a, it's okay if you can just get the display up quickly so that you can do things like backup cameras in cars or, or other things that have um, where some limited set of functionality is okay while the rest of, uh, to have up first while the rest of the system is coming up. And so uh, you can do something, uh, explicit probe ordering uh, can be used to get a specific subsystem up sooner than the rest of the system. So you can say, well, I want, I want these drivers to load before these other drivers. So there's really just kind of uh, ordering of things. There was a set of uh, patches having to do with this called on-demand probing. Uh, that uh, got rid of a lot of probe deferral. Right now, uh, the Linux kernel, what, there's a couple of things that determine what order the, the drivers get loaded in and probed in, and uh, some, sometimes it boils down to just link order. Uh, this, and so uh, all, almost all drivers in the Linux kernel have to be prepared to, if they go out and are looking for their resources and they can't find them, they have to say, okay, well, I'm gonna back off I'll return a special error code uh, to the caller saying that I, I couldn't find what I needed just yet, but call me again in the future. It's called probe defer. Uh, so this on-demand probing uh, switched that around, uh, but it was NAC. Some people didn't like what it was doing. I thought it was too complicated. Uh, also, no one has actually measured the overall effect on boot time of those patches, and so um, I think this probe deferral, though, is an issue, uh, and I think uh, we'll see some work on it. Uh, specifically, uh, Rafael Waisaki uh, said that we really do need a dependency graph in the kernel, and uh, he talked about that at the kernel summit, doing, doing something to help with this problem. Uh, also, in terms of boot up time, the kernel signification project helps uh, because smaller size of the kernel uh, means shorter load times. Um, and so that, that helps some speed ups. There's a, been a couple of good um, talks uh, on, uh, well, system D and embedded. System D is, is used uh, by some embedded systems to help speed up the boot uh, system as well as some other features that system D provides. And then there were some good talks uh, at ELC uh, Europe last year, 2014, and ELC uh, 2015. Uh, at this point, I feel a little bit like uh, we're using the same techniques over and over again, and, and it's just uh, we we don't we're not making kind of systemic uh, overall improvements in boot time. We're we're kind of uh, just using the same techniques, and uh, it requires some manual customization. But a lot of developers are able to get uh, one to two second boot time. There was a talk at ELC uh, Europe. Uh, just this year, 2015, uh, by a developer who was able to get a, a machine booting in under a second, uh, pretty much using the same techniques that we've been using for years. So, and boot time is in pretty good shape, but it still requires a lot of manual effort, which is unfortunate. Um, moving on to device tree. Uh, device tree is a, is a kind of a new uh, area of device development. So. Uh, because of the desire to have to kernel and make things in general and possible, and to be able to run a single kernel image on multiple different uh, hardware where the buses are not discoverable and the hardware is not discoverable. So there's this uh, uh, feature called the device tree which conveys that hardware information uh, into the kernel. And so a lot of drivers have to be rewritten to 
uh, support the notion of putting some of your configuration in a separate data structure that can be loaded at boot time. Uh, well, this splitting the driver into two pieces, uh, a configuration piece or a hardware description piece and another piece uh, has has uh, really resulted in uh, kind of extending the amount of time it takes to write drivers. And uh, we've seen a lot, plus it, it introduces a new uh, area. This device tree um, description has to be uh, run, passed, and approved by the DT maintainer, device tree maintainer. And there's just very few of these guys. So the entire the drivers make up over 50% of the kernel and the device tree maintainers are only about uh, three or four guys. Um, and so they just don't have enough bandwidth to review stuff. And that, that's be started to become a real problem um, in terms of getting stuff upstream. Uh, but some progress is being made to make things better. Uh, people are getting used to the notion, and I think uh, subsystem maintainers are doing a better job of uh, reviewing some of the device tree stuff to help the DT maintainers out. Uh, there was a good talk at uh, ELC 2015, uh, Device Tree as a Stable ABI at Fairytale, uh, where Thomas Tenzoni, one of the uh, one of the people who's done been very successful at mainlining uh, stuff for the all winter chipset, uh, talks about some of the problems that Device Tree has introduced and uh, some of the issues that it causes. Um, another thing happening with Device Tree is overlays, so. Uh, there are a lot of boards, uh, especially these development boards, things like the BeagleBone uh, and the Raspberry Pi, that have support for daughter boards that uh, you just plug into the system and they're not discoverable. And uh, the only way to get a kernel that can successfully deal with these is to um, support D, uh, DTS changes at boot time. And so there's been quite a bit of work to support what are called device tree overlays. Uh, and there's a good talk by Ken Pantelis uh, and Fan Wo, uh, the transactional device tree and overlays, and uh, uh, showing how to do this. This stuff is already upstream and appears to be working uh, better. They're fine tuning some of the aspects of it. Uh, but it's pretty amazing that uh, you can now pass uh, information to the kernel uh, at runtime and uh, change some of the information about the hardware description. Um, also, device trees uh, are a fairly new thing, uh, and they're right now the documentation about how to write uh, the device tree nodes is all just in plain English text. And uh, what they'd really like to do is they'd like to add some the ability to do some type checking and to validate that the uh, device tree kind of conforms to a set of standards for uh, for uh, interacting with the kernel and for how devices should be laid out. So there's been some new work on validating the device tree. Matt Porter uh, is creating a formal binding document standard. This would be essentially kind of like a schema. Uh, Frank Rowan has been implementing a parser to go along with that. I worked a little bit on a validator. Rob uh, Herring has also been doing some work uh, in this area. The, the general idea is that the binding docs that we have now would be compared against the schema and we could uh, then use them, since they're more formally described, uh, we could use, um, we could look at the actual DPS entries, compare them against the binding doc, and report the errors. The reason this is essential is because uh, right now there's no type information, there's basically just a lot of raw numbers, and we want to make sure that those numbers conform to uh, certain constraints. Otherwise, you can end up with these very, very difficult to debug problems. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about maybe adding this check patch or into the kernel build so we can find these problems without having to, developers having to do a lot of really difficult debugging. Uh, the V2, uh, version two of that specification that Matt Ford has been working out has been published, but we're still hashing out some of the details. So uh, this is a, a big area of work, I think. I think it'll be really, really useful uh, for driver writers uh, to have a more formal mechanism to, for handling their DPS entries. Uh, final thing on device tree, Frank Rowland, a lot of you know Frank, uh, he's been around, he's uh, also working at Sony. 
Um, and he's actually been made a device tree maintainer. Um, and he's been uh, trying to help out with uh, a lot of these issues by working on some debugging tools. Uh, he's given uh, some good talks um, uh, at LinuxCon North America. He also gave another uh, a good talk at the ELC Europe this year. And there was a big uh, device tree session at Plumber this year where they talked about a lot of stuff. So that's it for device tree. And for area of graphics, Kind of a uh, big thing in the embedded space is, uh, and this is uh, not really hit yet that I can see, but it's coming, is something called the Vulkan API. Uh, so the Kronos group has been the one that has uh, uh, been kind of a maintainer of the standards and promoter of the standards for OpenGL and uh, uh, particularly OpenGL ES, which is used in Android systems and in a lot of embedded systems. Well. People have found that there are some uh, performance problems, some bottlenecks in OpenGL. And so uh, AMD and Intel have uh, kind of introduced this new API, Vulkan. And the intent is to reduce the CPU overhead uh, for CPU to GPU operation. So this is uh, kind of a new uh, API <coughs> and graphics that will be in higher performance. Uh, AMD had announced plans to open source the driver. Uh, but the Intel and Valve uh, doing, uh, using Linux in gaming systems had already uh, started working on an open source driver. So I think we'll, uh, this will actually be pretty popular for high-end uh, graphics systems in Linux in the future. Uh, the other area of graphics that's interesting, I think, is just uh, whether or not we have free drivers, free and open source drivers for GPUs. So there's uh, a lot of different uh, GPUs. I'll go through some just really quickly. Uh, the free Greeno seems to be the most uh, farthest along. This is the GPU that's used, uh, well, the Adreno GPU is used on Qualcomm uh, processors, so it's very, very popular in mobile devices, mobile phones and tablets. Qualcomm has uh, quite a big market share there. And there's a lot of this is actually running. I just saw this last week, I saw um, a demo of Quake running on mobile hardware using completely open source uh, GPU driver. And so there's uh, some great great work going on in this area. Um, Power VR, which is another very popular GPU used in the embedded space. Uh, it was leaked over the summer that maybe there would be a Power VR driver uh, in open source. Uh, but there was a blog by uh, one of the executives of Imagination, but we haven't, haven't heard anything since then, so I don't know what's going on. This was in June, but we'll see uh, see what happens. Um, Etna V, which is an open source driver for Vivante, uh, is used on Freescale ch uh, chips. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of work on this, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting, I was talking to one of the developers of this at ELC Europe, and they said that uh, one of the things that happens when you open source the driver is a lot of things get a lot smaller because you're able to use existing kernel frameworks. <coughs> So he was talking about one section of the code where they took a 65k kernel driver that was out of tree, uh, not in mainline, and when they mainlined it, they were able to reuse other parts of the kernel and produce a driver that was only 6.5k. Uh, so that's a, that's a big improvement. I think we'll see those types of improvement as we get these other drivers into mainline. There's a good talk uh, by Lucas. He gave a he gave a talk at uh, ELC Europe, but I haven't seen the slides yet, so I need to ping him on that. But there's some other slides he gave at another conference that you can look at there if you want to find out about uh, the status of the FFD driver. And then there's Hugo for NVIDIA. Uh, that's actually uh, been making some progress as well. That's uh, not as much in the embedded space. Uh, a lot of desktops uh, using NVIDIA drivers or NVIDIA hardware, and then also uh, another GPU in the uh, embedded space is Molly, which is ARM's GPU, and there's a Lima project. This one seems to be stalled, actually. Uh, there have been recent discussions of putting uh, Molly code into the staging, uh, but uh, there's been resistance to that because it hasn't been well supported by the actual ARM developers uh, doing work. Um, so. Uh, okay, so moving on to file systems. So I mentioned earlier that SquashFS now supports LD4 compression. We have the OverlayFS, uh, which is pretty cool. It supports read-write file systems over the top of a read-only file system. 
that's useful in some embedded scenarios. Uh, and there's been proposals for uh, having UDIFS uh, handle MLC NAND better. There's a lot of complexity due to the characteristics of uh, MLC, multi-level uh, flash. Uh, but people are working on it for us, Brazilian. I can't remember what company he works for, but he, uh, he gave some information about that at ELC. And then I'll, I already mentioned that ext 3 was removed from the kernel. Uh, there was some good talks. There was a really excellent uh, talk comparing different file systems that was given at ELC. Uh, this last one, ELC Europe, um, uh, Richard Weinberger, who works for Linutronics, uh, gave uh, some good information about what some of the current problems are and some of the issues are in using UBIFS and, and some of the roadmap for how people are trying to fix things there. Uh, so that's a really good one if you're using UBIFS in your product. Um, so networking. So we have Bluetooth. Uh, Bluetooth 4.2 uh, has come out and has better security and faster speeds. It's got integration with 6 low pan, and there's a lot of people working on mesh networking with Bluetooth. Uh, there are some new protocols that we're just seeing coming about. Uh, Thread uh, is really not brand new, but it's kind of a take on uh, existing uh, existing uh, uh, internet stacks, but uh, with some tweaks for low power. And then there's a bunch of other kind of strange ones in the IoT space, SIGBOX, low row WAN. Uh, I don't have time to get into all of those. One of the most interesting things I saw at uh, ELC Europe this year was uh, visible light communication. So this is uh, the Disney Corporation has an R&D group in uh, Switzerland, and they've been working on putting Linux into uh, light bulbs, so the light bulbs can communicate with toys uh, that have LEDs in them, doing LED to LED uh, communication. And uh, LED, it turns out, you can use as both a transmitter for the light signal, obviously, it emits light, but it actually is also a very cheap uh, light sensor. And so for very low cost, they can put some really interesting uh, features into toys and also into garments. There was a, there was a, uh, a demo, uh, a demo video at DLC uh, Europe showing a, a little girl's uh, princess dress that uh, you could communicate to it and it would light up and sparkle when you pointed a magic wand at it. Uh, so it looks like very much fun for kids, but uh, also integrated with some of this uh, mesh networking done via Linux on light bulbs and, and other devices. So that's a very interesting networking that I think we'll probably see more of in the future using visible light. Um, let's see, in terms of power management, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of features already